I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm Lorenzo Brown. I'm the executive director of the Is Able Center. And uh, I want to thank Alabama Care for giving us an opportunity to share with you on this platform today. And today I am joined by Bob Lajarno, Lajarno, <laughs> and he's an inclusion <laughs> with uh, uh, with Nick Pad. And so Bob, you wanna um, kind of introduce yourself? All right, well, hello, Lorenzo, and uh, thank you uh, for joining uh, or allowing me to speak today and uh, welcome everyone that's joining in. Uh, uh, yes, I currently uh, work at the Lakeshore Foundation for the National Center on Health, Physical Activity and Disability, also known as Nick Pad, and it is headquartered at Lakeshore Foundation. And, as an inclusion specialist, a lot of my job is very much responding to uh, people with disabilities across the nation that are either looking for resources uh, on health, wellness, fitness, exercise, nutrition. Um, I'm over a database that has information for you know, organizations that serve people with disabilities um, that uh, have you know just mountains of information in, in regards to wanting to uh, better improve your life and, and serve you. So um, so a lot of that responsibility falls to me and, and a lot of our staff. And also very much uh, do a lot of promoting of inclusion uh, to different organizations. Uh, sometimes I even have to go to, to Washington, D.C. and, and uh, advocate there as well. So uh, very much looking to promote inclusion, not only here within Birmingham, Alabama, uh, statewide, nationwide, and even though you've had, had opportunities to go uh, internationally uh, to send that same message as well. well. That's awesome, man. So I want to thank you so much for coming on with us, Bob, today, man. I really appreciate it. Um, I've shared this with you before, but I want to share with those of, or, who are on live with us today. I remember back in 1997, um, I had been injured for a little over two and a half years at the time. And I was transferred to uh, the Lakeshore campus to a transitional living unit that's set on the Lakeshore campus. And um, I was right at about 21 years old. And I was so discouraged, so depressed, and just really looking to end life. I didn't want to live. And I remember sitting out in front of the transitional living unit and I saw this guy, you know, rolling down the sidewalk with no arms, no legs. And he went up to what I think it was a blazer or a Bronco, but he opened up the back side of it and pulled himself into the back of this uh, SUV with a rope and pulled his chair in and then got in the driver's side seat and, and, and you know, cranked the car up and drove away. And it was one of the most amazing things I had ever seen. And that day was the end of excuses for me. And um, and I had not met Bob at that time. So Bob, uh, you remember that, that Blazer and Bronco, what was it? Yeah, it was a, a Chevy S10 Blazer. Um, that's kind of what I usually prefer to drive. And yes, I, uh, I, I've downsized since then. So I have a little four door, uh, Chevy, um, Sonic. So a lot smaller car, better on efficiency. Um, uh, so, but, uh, yes, I, I, for, for many years drove, uh, uh SUVs or, um, you know, four or actually more Chevys than, than anything else. So, so how did you come up with the idea to, you know, pull yourself up in the vehicle by a rope? <laughs> well, actually, I, I didn't use a rope to get myself into the vehicle. Uh, and I pulled a chair up by myself. But once I closed the bottom part, you had to reach up to close the top part. And that's when I used a string, a shoe string. Um, and I actually okay. still use it. Uh, on my Chevy Sonic, my smaller car, just to close the trunk. Um, but yeah, it was a lot easier using the string to close the glass part of the trunk uh, when I 
got myself into into the vehicle. Um, that was many moons ago. Um, I'm sure I could still do it if needing to, but uh, it was a lot smarter that I downsized and got a smaller car. Yeah. So, close the glass part of the trunk. So who came up with the idea? Oh, it was it was me. You know, uh, the thing about disability is we, we sometimes are the best uh, creators of our own inventions and it's our ingenuity uh, that we use to really better our lives, you know, find ways to, well, how do I pick that off the floor or how did that reach that above me? You know, it's up to us to come up with ways and, and um, you know, a lot of the ideas I've always had because I just remember growing up uh, with my disability, I lost my limbs when I was nine. So I really had to come up with ideas for, for PE class, for playing sports, for just anything I wanted to be involved in. I just found a way to adapt and modify it so that I could be a part of it. So, um, you know, I think I give all credit and glory to God that I uh, have that capability, um, just wanting to really come up with my own way of, of making my world accessible to me. So uh, my understanding, you you were eight years old when you lost your limbs. Yeah, I was nine. Yeah, it was 1979. So, uh, so I've been without hands and legs for over 40 years. And so I've had a lot of time to come up with different ways. Probably one of my most unique creations was um, um, I had trouble when, when I would get around my house as a, as a, as a youth um, teenager. I didn't use a wheelchair. I preferred just to hop along the floor to get to the bathroom, to get to the you know, dining area and living room, my bedroom. The only issue was turning on lights. It was difficult to reach lights because they were pretty high up uh, along the wall. Well, I went with my dad many times for golf because he loved the golf. And one day he missed a, a two foot, you know, birdie shot and got so angry that he threw his putter down and broke the head of the putter. And so mm -hmm. that gave me an idea. Well, that don't throw that stick away, dad. Let me use it and I can turn on lights and reach things that are above me. And so that's kind of one of my earliest inventions, if you will, um, that I came up with. So. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's pretty awesome. So you, when I was reading through your book, I had, that's what I, when I was really getting to know more about you. And man, you experienced a lot of obstacles. You know, share some of those obstacles that you ran into and how you overcame those those, those challenges that you faced. Sure, well, the most difficult part of overcoming a disability or, or living with your disability is uh, just the mental aspect of it. You know, just realizing you know, this is how it's going to be. Uh, you know, I'm not going to have any hands and, and, and legs. You know, they're not going to grow back. And and even though I used prosthetics for many years, you know, at the end of the day, I was still going to always have people point and stare, uh, sometimes even laugh uh, about the way that I look. So, you know, I needed to get some tough skin, if you will. And, and uh, very fortunate that, uh, you know, my dad was really very instrumental in, in developing that tough skin and that tough mindset because, um, you know, despite you know, having a disability, not having hands and legs, when I, when I got in trouble and did something wrong or said something wrong or, um, you know, I was disciplined uh, and, and it wasn't uh, timeouts, you know, so, so, you know, the most difficult part is the mental aspect and just knowing you're going to be different. And, and once you realize that, and once you realize that it's okay to be different, uh, as a matter of fact, school was very much a blast. Uh, elementary school was very exciting. Uh, you know, people wanted to come up and approach me and talk to me. And it was difficult in the beginning because wasn't quite sure why they wanted to approach me uh, other than to play with my wheelchair or, or ask all the same questions. Um, so my principal actually came up with a great idea. He just said, Hey, Bob, I'm going to put you in the auditorium and invite all the students and you're going to be on stage and they're going to ask you every question. And once you've answered every question, you can then go on and just be like any other kid and try to have fun and make friends and, and, and go through school. So 
so that was you know that was very smart on his end. Um, I guess another um, obstacle would be very much uh, getting through physical education, and and I touched on it a little bit earlier with coming up with ideas for me to participate in, in activities. Uh, the PE teachers didn't want me to do anything really. They just kind of, all right, Bob, you know, we're gonna do basketball today. You get to hang over here on the table and, and play checkers or something or, or keep the score. And, you know, I really wanted to be out there involved um, in activities. So I again, just came up with ways for me to be involved. Uh, um, I guess what was probably the most uh, rewarding part of that was during that time of PE, like when basketball was going on, I, I walked with prosthetic legs and I had artificial arms and I even used a cane to walk to help me with balance. Well, when it was time for basketball, of course, no one wanted to pick me on their side because, you know, he didn't have any hands, he can't catch, he didn't have any hands, he can't shoot the ball. Well, one thing they didn't consider is, um, you know, I'm, I'm five foot six at this time, but when I raise my cane in the air, I'm about the size of Shaquille O'Neal. Ha, so ha, 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 ha. Yeah, so whenever these guys would come down the lane for a layup, you know, I'm there blocking the shot and blocking it very well. And so uh, next time when it came to picking teams, uh, Bob wasn't the last player picked anymore. So, uh, again, these are just kind of things that, that come to my mind initially as a young person. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about your mindset and your attitude. Very fortunate to have uh, loving parents and, and my faith in God and, and support of my, my whole family. And once you, once you have that, and, and even my community was very much in support of me, once you have all that, there's really no reason to, um, you know, for lack of a better word, feel sorry for yourself or, or think that life is over. Um, now granted, you know, my situation might've been very different from yours. You know, I don't know what kind of family support you had, you know, if I didn't have that family support, I might have been thinking those same thoughts you had. Uh, but I just yeah. kind of realized that you're alive for a reason. So, but, um, so I was um, talking about your book earlier. That's how I got to, to you know, to just know a, a lot of detail about your story. And, you know, and I was just blown away, man. And so uh, what I would like to do is uh, for those who are live with us today, I'm already seeing a lot of um, uh, uh, chatter inside of the comment box. So we're going to get to some of that. But uh, we're going to give away 10 copies, 10 free copies uh, that are going to be autographed by Bob of his book today. And so we'll show you a shot of his book. And uh, so for those who comment, give us some uh, some questions inside of the chat box the first 10 people uh, they are going to get a free copy of Bob's book no arms no legs no problem and so um, go ahead and put your questions in the, in the chat box and the first 10 people are going to get a, a, a free autographed copy of Bob's book no arms no legs no problem so Bob I'm looking at the subtitle of your book, it says, when life happens, you can wish to die or choose to live. How did you come up with that subtitle? Yeah, well, I was very fortunate to have a, a co-writer and I think you see her name is, is Tara Shiro. And she was you know, very instrumental in, in helping organize the book and, and things of that nature. Um, so when she, once we completed all our interviews and all the information and things that I wrote, you know, she kind of said, you know, at the end of the day, Bob, this just seems like it's, it's a, a choice between if a person wants to move forward in their life or, or not. And, um, and so I, I think she viewed it as me just being a person that is just choosing to move forward with their life and not looking at it as woe is me and, life's not worth living and, you know, 
So she she sees it as just you chose life, Bob. And so and and even if you read more into the book, and I don't want to give away the some of the um, I guess chapters of the book, but there was literally a time when I had to ask that question or answer that question. Um, you know, do you want to keep moving forward? And uh, and I said yes, I do want to keep moving forward. I do want to live. I do want to have as active as a life as I can have. And uh, so, yeah, so that was really kind of, really her perspective uh, on, I guess, my story. And, and that's kind of how she, she kind of coined that phrase, so. So I wanna uh, go to the, the chat box there. Uh, first of all, I wanna go back up at some of the people who kind of commented before there. And so uh, we looked at Miss Pat Motley. She said, um, Amazing testimony, Lorenzo. Thank you for all your years of service to individuals and family members who are dealing with accessible accessibility issues. And Pat Molly said, "Bob, thank you for inspiring Lorenzo all those years ago." And so, going down, uh, Leslie Speakman uh, gave us our very first question. She asked, um, "Besides writing, so what kind of work do you do?" Sure. My day to day, um, kind of how I stated in the beginning is, is really just responding to requests made by people with disabilities uh, nationwide. Basically, daily, uh, I'll get questions either over the phone on our listserv or our chat line. Uh, just, hey, Bob, you know, I just recently lost my limbs, want to start exercising, what do I do? And I provide them with resources. A um, couple of things that we also do is we produce a lot of videos uh, with Nick Pat, and a lot of these videos need to have a disability perspective. So many times I'm writing scripts on how the video should be shot and providing a voiceover. And actually sometimes I'm, I'm featured in the video itself, especially in regards to exercise. Um, many times I've created videos on the NICPAD website that uh, show me exercising um, and, and really just try to capture um, topics that are germane to people with disabilities. Uh, maybe people that uh, just newly uh, have a disability or people just wanting to exercise and what kind of exercise or workout, what kind of workout can, uh, can the individual do. So it's, it's about creating resources it's about distributing the resources. And many times I'm doing what I'm doing right now, just uh, jumping on calls and talking to different organizations. Uh, the big topic really right now is inclusion. You know, many organizations say, oh yeah, Bob, we, we want to be inclusive. We want our, you know, our work environment and we want our manuals or, uh, to be inclusive to people with disabilities. And and, and many organizations, they, they kind of mean well. Some really don't know what it means to be inclusive. Some organizations just want to check the old box. Oh, we had Bob come in and speak to us, so we're good on inclusion. Well, no, you know, what have you done policy-wise? You know, what changes have you done there? Um, maybe even to your own built environment, you know, is there an accessible entrance or is there accessible parking? Um, but the, to me, the key really is the, the policy. You know, you can sit there and say you're inclusive, but if it's not written down to where, you know, we must, you know, in our workforce, our employees, there must be people with disabilities, as well as people of color, as well as, you know, women. Um, you know, if, if you're not hitting those, uh, you know, including LGBTQ, you know, if you're not hitting those topics and, and writing them in your policy, then I'm not sure if you're making any change. You know, you can have leaders, but if the policy is still the same, then there's really no difference between the leader that just left and the leader that just arrived. It's really changing the policies and getting an understanding of what inclusion means. So that's so, kind Bob, of a lot. Of so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Let me ask you, uh, tell everybody what NICPAD stands for. Sure, NICPAD is the National Center on Health, uh, Physical Activity and Disability. And so the acronym is, is NICPAD, N-C-H-P-A-D. 
that's kind of written on my shirt. I don't know if you can see it, <laughs> but uh, what's the web, what's the website where people can access the resources uh, available in NICPAD? Sure, just go to uh, nchpad.org, uh, uh, nickpad.org, and you'll pull up the website, and you'll see these blue icons and. In those icons, click on them, and you'll, there's just mountains of articles and research information and resources. So, you know, feel free. And it's, and it's actually geared towards specific professions: you know, public health, uh, healthcare providers, uh, fitness professionals, uh, you know, educators. So, all of those professions are, are looking to address issues for people with disabilities, but really may not know how or where to find the latest uh, information and, and data. And we also very much provide information on what's going on today with COVID and the latest findings from CDC and how it specifically benefits people with disabilities. Um, we actually even created a needs assessment once the COVID virus came out and we were able to get a very good response from people with disabilities on things that they need, things that they're concerned about um, such as transportation, personal care. So there's there's a lot of great information in, in which that was our immediate response was to find out how COVID-19 is affecting people with disabilities and, and resources were created to address those needs. I got a second question. Uh, this question is from Lorraine Gillians Barnes. She uh, wants to know what inspired you to write a book? Uh, the main inspiration um, is really just to you know to thank God to, to thank my family, uh, but also um, there's many of my family members that have come up behind me, and, and a lot of them are a lot young, and uh, you know may not know exactly what happened, and so really I, I've written it all out for them to to read up on. Um, also, you know from from a you know religious standpoint, you know the, the Lord says to you know go about and, and and speaking His word. Well, throughout the book, you'll find many verses uh, that are favorites of mine, and that's kind of my way, if you will, of just uh, of sharing the gospel, if you will, of, 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 as we're all asked to do in, in some way or another. And, and you know, you can write it and live it. You know, those are ways to share the gospel, speak it. Uh, I wanted to make sure I was able to write some of my favorite verses down. But at the end of the day, it was really just a big thank you. And, and there's a lot of people in, in the book that I address and tell them specifically thank you. But at the end of the day, it was really just to kind of educate everybody and my family and, and also just people that maybe followed me early on uh, to kind of find out how I've been doing, how my life has been going. Uh, so those are really the main reasons. So before I go to the next question, for those of you who are just joining us, um, we are giving away 10 free copies of Bob's book. And we'll bring up a clip there for you can see the book there. And the book is No Arms, No Legs, No Problems. And we're giving away 10 free autograph copies to the first 10 people who ask us a question inside of the chat. So we already have two that are taken. And so I'm about to get to our third question. So our third question, Bob, is from Kathy Porter Dixon. She asked, what was the hardest part of telling your story? Oh, let's see, the hardest part of telling my story, goodness. Um, probably one of the things that my author, co-author, co Tara and I, kind of, um, I don't know, butting heads is the right word, um, I, one of the things we'd always have conversations about is she really wanted me to be forthcoming with emotion because she says, you know, you know, Bob, not everyone can be this happy go lucky. Not everyone can have this positive mindset. You know, what gets you upset? What are the, what are the things that really just get under your skin? What, what, what is something that's just driving you crazy because you have this disability and, and, and that you want to let people know. So we, we'd have these conversations and, and in my mind, I, I still always want to be positive because I think that's the best way to, you know, 
to deal with situations uh, that come upon you that drastically change your life. But you also have to be real about it. You, you know, yeah, not, not every day is, uh, you know, blue skies and apple pie. So, you know, that's what she wanted me to also express. So there are times in the book where I, I guess what you call, allow myself to be vulnerable. <laughs> so, you know, and that was really kind of the most difficult time. She, she really wanted to know, you know, you know, in the first chapters, you know, what are you actually feeling? Aren't you mad at God? Aren't you mad at, you know, everything? You know, just, she really wanted, she really had a way of kind of pulling that out of me. And so throughout the book, you'll see, I guess me being vulnerable, if you will. So the most difficult part was just, you know, when she says, I want you to be vulnerable, Bob, tell me what you're really feeling here. You know, um, I, 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 I succumb to her wishes. And, and there are many times where I um, open up my heart and I'm, I'm very vulnerable. So yeah, I see that she, your, your, um, is it Tara or Tara? Uh, Tara, T-A-R-A, -A, Tara. I, I saw where she said that, you know, she thought you was living a lot. How could somebody who went through what you went through, you know, be so positive and upbeat and see the positive side of life, you know? And I think that, um, Bob, that's probably the um, misconception that a lot of people have when they see individuals that live with disabilities. They see the challenges, they see the obstacles, they see maybe it's unfair that they have to go through what they're going through and 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 kind of make get the understanding that there's a kind of a, a bitter approach to life because of what you're you know you're faced with and not quite understand how you can be so positive you know despite the challenges that that you're living with mm -hmm. yeah so yeah i'm sorry go ahead uh, uh, go ahead sir. yeah just for me you know, you know, my, my, I was, I was, I'm not supposed to be alive. You know, typically mm -hmm. majority of the people at the illness I had have died. So once I was kept alive or am alive, it's like, well, you know, the Lord wants to be around for a reason and it's not to bury my head in the sand and, and say, woe is me. You know, it's about getting out there and, and realizing that, you know, life is to be experienced and, you know, I, I wanted to learn how to drive, and I did. I wanted to go to college and, and you, know, you know, get married and, and have children and grandchildren. And, you know, these are just things that, uh, that I definitely wanted to be, you know, have in my life and travel, play sports. You know, these are still things I've always wanted to do and was able to, uh, to accomplish. So, you know, to me, it, it was, a, a, and I always say when I speak that my disability is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, it's allowed me to work at Lake Shore for over 20 years. It's allowed me to uh, play for Team USA, uh, travel the world, and, and you know win a bronze medal in wheelchair rugby. So again, uh, you know there, there was no reason for me uh, because of all the love and support of, of my family and friends and faith in God. There was no reason for me to, to bury my head in the sand and, and to think life was over. So. But, um, so I got another question here, and this question is actually from Alabama Care. They would like to know, how can we as an internet and video broadcast company be more inclusive? Very good question. Well, if you go to the NICPAD website, uh, nchpad.org, uh, there's uh, information on how to be uh, more inclusive and in regards to the world of internet and, and videography, um, what really has to happen is making sure that your, you know, your services can be accessed by people with disabilities, uh, people that are blind, people that uh, are deaf, uh, people with intellectual disability. Um, you know, there are ways for that to happen. There's software out there that you can access that will make you know, any, any platform on social media accessible to people with disabilities. Um, many of the virtual presentations that I'm a part of, many organizations have a, a person that's there to either do ASL sign language uh, or they're there to provide audio script. 
so every word can be uh, visualized. So again, you know, there's there's definitely ways to uh, to meet that uh, that medium of being inclusive through social media. And uh, so the information is there. I can email it to you myself because it's part of the things I do throughout the day. So uh, so yes, those are definitely kind of the way. There are many ways for which. Uh, and many organizations can be inclusive to people with disabilities. I got another question. This question is from Madeline Brown, my mother. She would like to know. <laughs> she would like to know. Can you write another book about your life now? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, Miss Brown, let me just say that uh, Lorenzo is a godsend, and thank you. Uh, for having him and raising him and loving him because he's definitely benefited our community. Um, you know, the book that I wrote, which was published in 2014, it came from an idea from when I was 17. When I was 17 years old and about ready to graduate high school, uh, I wrote down a list of 20 things that I wanted to accomplish. You know, going to college, driving a car, uh, you name it, playing sports, um, so I wrote down a list of, and the last two items, uh, 19 and 20, have just been accomplished in the last five years. Um, I, I wrote and published the book and I got married uh, in 2017. So both those things have just happened in the last you know five to seven years. So that's always a very common question. So what's next? So next I'm kind of writing down the next 20 things to accomplish. And uh, a lot of those things are happening pretty quickly. So I'm not saying it's gonna happen today or tomorrow, but uh, I can definitely see it in the future, in the near future of it, uh, of there being a part two, but I don't know. I, I still think I need to wait another maybe five to 10 years. So, so we'll see. Yeah. You know, I, I remember um, Bob, um, I think you were speaking at Disability Rights and Resources and um, I was in the audience and out there, you finished speaking, you and I was talking and you was asking me about my wife and kids and you were not married at the time. And you said, well, one of my <laughs> goals is to be married, have kids, you know, and so, uh, and then shortly after that, you met your wife and got married. And, um, and so that, that's a beautiful thing, man. And so, but I got another yeah, question day. here. From, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. I was going to say, on the day I got married, I became a husband, a step-parent, and a grandparent, all on the same day. So, uh, yeah, my life, I wanted a family. I, I definitely got it. <laughs> you got you got it all. In, you killed, you yeah. killed two birds with one stone, per se. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> I got another question from Pat Motley. Uh, first of all, Pat, thank you so much for all that you do through the Alabama Head Injury Foundation. Uh, we're so grateful for the service that you provide in the community. Um, would love to have you on Alabama Care as well to talk about the resources at the Alabama Head Injury Foundation. And so, but Pat has a question for you, Bob. Uh, the question is, where do people with physical disabilities who live in the more rural parts of Alabama go for exercise? And then she goes on to add, I work with people who have sustained spinal cord injuries and am excited when I hear they live in or in and around Birmingham because I can refer them to Lakeshore Foundation. But those from other areas, I find it difficult to locate a resource for those that so badly want to be physically active any suggestions appreciate sure probably the first thing is to uh try to contact your local ymca um, and i know that can be even a challenge as well um, also your local community college or even university um, there's definitely programs and activities that go on there's uh, you know orders uh, universities that at times contact us at, at NICPAD uh, at Lakeshore to, you know, hey, how do we get, you know, we have a population of, of, of this many students with disabilities. How do we get wheelchair basketball going? Or how do we 
you know, get something from a recreation standpoint or an exercise standpoint. Um, so we definitely provide them with those resources. Um, but yeah, that, those would be my first initial is, is to look into, you know, whatever local school is around and you know, local YMCA. Um, Cause at the end of the day, you know, the organizations are there pretty much. I think they're, they are looking for people and those would be kind of the first resources I'd start off with as far as what's in your local community. So, Bob, then, um, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and finish. Yeah, I was gonna say, and if worse comes to worse, if you go back to the NICPAD website, uh, we have a program called a 14 week program, which you can access online. Uh, and that actually, all you need is a computer and we can send you exercises and strength workouts and things of that nature that keep you healthy and active because it, it addresses a lot of the barriers that people with disability uh, have experienced, which is, um, you know, not access to facilities to exercise. Maybe the cost is very expensive. Maybe there's no transportation. So all you need is kind of a computer and you can do some of these activities at, uh, on your own. And there's even a social component added to it as well. So. A uh, 14 week program would be something to start off with uh, for people in rural areas. You know, I actually did the 14 week program myself during the pandemic, you know, and it was you know, really. getting pretty active. And, and it, was, it was awesome. Again. It was awesome. Yeah. Well, that's why you so, look good uh, still. <laughs> say that again. That's why you're looking good still. <laughs> that's right. You know, I yeah, was uh, chasing all those kids around. <laughs> chasing kids around, exactly. Especially my little three-year-old, he, he keeps me going. So, uh, Bob, uh, when when the new addition was added on to Lakeshore, uh, during the during the um, the grand opening, um, I came over and and one of the wonderful things that I saw you doing. Uh, you were actually teaching a class to somebody who was in a, a whole nother state and you was doing it remotely. So tell us about that. Yes, uh, and because of uh, what's happening with COVID-19, you know, a lot of our uh, meetings and a lot of our programs actually have gone virtual as well. So that, that new addition was to very much provide that type of programming. It also provided what we call um, this new program called Mentor. Uh, Mentor is an acronym, uh, Mindfulness, Exercise, Nutrition to Optimize Resiliency, uh, Mentor. The objective, again, was to reach people outside of Birmingham um, and have them connect with people that are, have a new disability and to let them know, hey, there's you know still exercise you need to be involved in. And what we've done with Mentor is created um, various things to address health. We all know that exercise is important. We all know that nutrition is important, but there's a whole bunch of other components to, to really benefit your health. Uh, and it could be outdoor experiences. It could be arts and crafts. Uh, it could be you know, rest and relaxation. You know, a lot of people, believe it or not, don't get enough good sleep. So again, these are, there's many different things with the mentor program that allows people uh, with disabilities uh, to really optimize their health or, or benefit and improve their health. So we've had to do a lot of this virtually. I'm, I'm actually a mentor coach as well. So once every week I, I meet up with about five to seven people virtually and just talk them through the mentor program and what they're doing and what they're not doing and just really just be there for, for someone for them to talk to. But as they are part of this mentor program, they also will go through exercises from our exercise coaches, nutrition uh, from uh, our chefs that provide uh, accessible, nutritious uh, meals. So again, um, you know, again, the whole objective with mentor through this part of our new Lakeshore building is to provide this type of virtual health component uh, to prove, to improve people's health. Bob, is this, is there a cost to this, to have access to mentor? 
Well, what's happening now is we've been able to expand more nationally. So we've been able to reach out to various uh, rehabilitation organizations uh, in other states. And what they have done is they've had some of their coaches go to our mentor training, and now they're using the mentor service to reach people in their areas. In regards to mentor itself, um, there is a website, uh, mentor.org, and that is kind of a way to connect people. Um, I know in regards to the recruitment aspect of it, um, that's a little bit more specified as we have people at Lakeshore um, that are actually calling out to specific populations. So the objective really is to find uh, new people in, with a specific population of disability and it's the, that type of uh, people that are recruited into the mentor program. So, you know, to say, just call 1-800 and you're in, uh, that's not really how it works, but uh, it's, it's growing more and more and we'll eventually get more and more people into it. Uh, but as of right now, it's still kind of in its infancy, if you will. Um, it's probably kind of almost still in a pilot stage, if you will. But eventually we'll get to that component where we'll be able to uh, look to, rec you know, to recruit in, in large numbers. So uh, to those of you who are maybe just joining in, we probably got about a good 17 or 18 more minutes left. And we're giving away 10 free copies of Bob's book uh, to the first 10 people who come in inside of the chat. Uh, we have, I think, about four more left uh, to give away uh, there, maybe five. I'm not sure. I have to go back and count, but four or five more. They're going to be autographed by Bob. Uh, we'll bring up a um, um, so you can see the book there in, uh, here. And so we're going to give away 10 free copies autographed by Bob. Uh, no arms, no legs, no problem. When life happens, uh, you can wish to die or choose to live. And we have probably about four more left. Okay. So uh, before I take the next question, Bob, uh, I was thinking of back, back on when your, um, when your principal came to you and ask you to speak inside of the auditorium. How old were you at that point? I was uh, like uh, 10, 10 and a half, maybe 11. So and I missed about a half of school. So it was probably about 11, 11 years old. So, so it, you're it's 11 mentioned. Years old. I'm sorry, go ahead. You, hey, you're 11 years old and your principal comes up to you and say, hey, we're gonna put you in the auditorium from the whole school put you on the stage and you're going to answer any questions that they have, you know, and you're going to share, you know, I mean, uh, were you freaked out of your mind? Were you uh, offended? I mean, what did you think? Well, uh, I loved it um, because first of all, I do like people and I do want, I like to approach people and I thought it was a great idea just from the standpoint of, you know, everyone was going to ask the same question. You know, what happened? How'd you lose your limbs? So if I could just address the entire school, then that will kind of be over with and I can go on to trying to meet people and, and have friends and things of that nature. Um, and it, it was great, it, it was great looking back now because it was actually the beginning of a, of a second career I have. I'm, I'm actually, uh, a professional international public speaker. So, you know, I started at that time at age 11, not knowing, you know, 30 years later, 30 to 40 years later, I'll, I'll be doing it uh, somewhat professionally speaking about my disability. So again, it was a great idea from, from Principal Barry Hill and uh, um, it, it very much was just great. And for me, because afterwards, then people were just coming up left and right and just Hey Bob, you want to, you know, spend the night tomorrow night, or you want to, you know, we're gonna go watch a movie and things of that nature. So got to work on developing friends and having friends. Uh, and actually, from that, I still have a friend that I met from that experience and that I'm friends with to this day. So yeah, it was it was a great idea. <laughs> so. And where did you go to school? 
Uh, I was born in Kansas and moved all in a couple different states, lived in Cincinnati, Ohio. And then um, I went back to Kansas at age five, uh, well, maybe around seven, excuse me, around seven, went back to Kansas. My parents uh, had separated, divorced, it, it's all in the book. And uh, so was living in Kansas and that's when I lost my limbs. And then dad took us back to Dallas, uh, bought a house there and, and lived there for about the 13, 14 years. So, but, um, but so it was during that time in Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth area. Uh, that I was raised um, during that time. Got another question for you from Darcy Porter Dixon. The question <laughs> is, other, other than your faith, what would you recommend to individuals that may struggle emotionally with acceptance of their disability? Well, at the end of the day, in order to you know, to address issue, issues that you may have with yourself, you know, you, you got to go really outside yourself because, you know, at the end of the day, how you see yourself may not be how other people see you. So get involved in your community, your, you know, whether your church community, whether it be, you know, a, a, a food shelter, a home shelter, excuse me. Um, you know, there are things that go on in your community that you need to be a part of, you know, you, you just don't live in a city just to live in a city. You, you live in a city to be a part of that city. And part of that city can be volunteering at a, one of your favorite places. Uh, you know, one of my first jobs um, was actually working um, kind of part time at the uh, pizza place, just answering a phone, just, you know, taking orders for pizza, you know. Um, but, it, you know, it's up to you to get yourself and part, make yourself a part of your community, you know, and, and that's really kind of how you can deal with issues on yourself because it's not until you get around other people that you can kind of, they can see, well, you know, this person's real caring or this person's real intelligent or this person really has a neat perspective on life. There's more to this person than just their disability. So it, I would recommend just getting involved in your community. There's many things to be involved with from a volunteer standpoint. Maybe not right now because we're all going through a pandemic, uh, but that's what I would recommend because you know, you're, you're not gonna solve your issues in a room with four walls. You know, you need to, to get out into the world. You know, maybe it's an exercise group. Maybe it's, you know, a cycling group, you know, whatever it may be, you know, your, our bodies are meant to be in motion. So just get out there in the world, find an find something you can volunteer with and that is how you really can see yourself in a different light and and once you see yourself in a different light once other people see there's more to you than just a disability then you're probably going to see yourself too than more than just being a disabled person you know bob man that's such great advice you know darcy uh bob said something that was really really profound he said, you know when you see your own self in a different light then other people are going to see you in a different way as well you know i remember early on with my disability i really struggled you know i was you know a, afraid to really go out into public and one of the main reasons was because you know i had lost the ability to control my bladder and my and my bowels and so early on you know before i learned how to do my bowel program, I would have bowel accidents in public and that really embarrassed me, you know, and it caused me to really, you know, suffer in my self-esteem esteem, and, and I really had low confidence in myself. And, it, and over time, I really had to work to, you know, build some confidence in myself and get back out inside of the community. And over time, you know, as the more I went out the more I got around people, you know, and people started seeing the qualities and the benefits that I had, you know, the more confidence that I started to gain. And I remember um, when I met my wife, um, I was 27 years old. She was 23 years old, beautiful, 23 year old young lady, you know, um, could have, you know, had any, you know, young man that she wanted. And actually, 
uh, there was a, a another gentleman uh, that was an able-bodied guy who was, you know, interested in dating her around the same time that I was interested in dating her. And, um, and she chose me over this guy. And I remember asking her, you know, uh, when we was out to a date, I said, you know, you're a beautiful 23 year old young lady. I said, you could, you know, have any man that you want. And you had this other guy who, you know, was able-bodied, um, could have chose him. Why did you choose me? And you know what she responded and said? She said, because you're the most confident man that I ever met. <laughs> so, you know, if her, my disability, my situation didn't make any difference to, to, to her. What matter is that I believed in myself, you know? So yeah, when you start seeing yourself in a different light, it causes others to see you in a different light as well. And I'm sure, Bob, you know, your wife could have someone else too, but she chose you. And I'm sure it was because of the confidence she saw in the man that you you are. Yeah. Well, thank you. Amen. So uh, uh, I'll go on here. Um, so Miss uh, a hometown uh, family friend there. She said, this is such a wonderful video. Thank you so much, Yolanda. I really appreciate you commenting there. And Angela Ballerina, her sister tagged her in this video and she's so grateful that her sister tagged her there. You know, Bob, I wanna talk a little bit um, here uh, on quad rubbing. So tell us, about murder ball. Yeah, tell us about murder ball. <laughs> sure, well, murder ball was uh, originally uh, developed or founded by the Canadians in the late 70s, and it was geared towards uh, athletes that had spinal cord injury and basically disability in their upper body. Uh, you know, there's two different types of spinal cord injuries. There's spinal cord where you're paralyzed from the waist down. And of course there's um, a spinal cord injury where you've broken uh, your vertebrae at the cervical level and you have paralysis in your hands and finger function. So they wanted to gear the sport towards uh, athletes that have paralysis in their, in their upper body and their hands and finger function and, and even balance. So rugby came to the States in the, uh, the mid eighties. Uh, we became a league, wheelchair rugby league in, in, in 1988. Uh, I didn't start playing until 1995. And lo and behold, I'd be, I played for 25 straight years uh, which included a seven year stint on the US wheelchair rugby team. Well, rugby is full wheelchair contact. And if you Google it, you'll see videos of us playing it uh, very fast, very physical. Uh, men and women both play the sport. Uh, it's, it's not for the meek. Um, uh, I love it. It was as close to football as I was gonna get to playing. Uh, like I said, I played for 25 years, very much enjoyed uh, my entire time. I literally just retired uh, this past year. Um, you know, after 25 years, I, I think that was a good time. I haven't had any serious injuries, uh, God willing. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it was, it's been a major part of my life. And fortunately, a, a movie was made out of it as well called Murder Ball, in which that movie was released. It was a documentary in 2005. So, um, and I was fortunate to be one of the athletes featured in the movie, in the documentary. And of course the documentary would go on to be nominated for Academy Award. So uh, it's very nice to be able to put that on a resume. But uh, it's been a great experience. It, it very much has allowed me to travel, travel the world. Uh, I think it's kept me in, in pretty good, decent shape. And, you know, it, it's been a very major part of my life. And I thank God that I was able to, uh, at the right time, be a part of that sport. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'll tell you, Bob, um, when I first got on the Lakeshore campus there at the Transitional Living Room, 
uh, Kevin Orr was the coach for uh, Quag Rubby. And so he was recruiting, you know, and so I was kind of <laughs> like the new quad. I was the new quad on the block. And so he came to me and said, hey, you should consider playing Quad Rubby. I said, well, what is Quad Rubby? He said, well, you know, come to a game and, and I'll show you. And so at, at this time, you know, um, uh, Lakeshore didn't have its facility. It was using, you know, the, um, I think it was, um, what, the Health South at the time, the Health South gym there. And so I'm in there watching my very first quad rugby game. And I see this guy who's, you know, a quadriplegic, paralyzed from his chest down. He gets hit so hard that his chair flipped and he's laying there until the coat the referee came and flipped his chair back over and he had <laughs> broke his two fingers in the middle and oh, the referee man. took some the referee took some tape and taped his two fingers back up and pushed him back out on the court <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah and that's I, rugby i left that that uh game and kevin said so are you in? I said, I'm sorry, Kevin. I'm not going to be able to play Carl Rubby. <laughs> and it's not made for every, everyone, and, and you had a greater calling. So that. <laughs> Kevin, look, he said, you too pretty to play anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's Kevin. Uh, best coach I've ever had. And, uh, just outstanding, outstanding leader of men. So I want to take a one last question here, Bob, and then um, we're going to let you go. So the last question here um, uh, is from Angelina Ballerina. She says, I'm a first timer here. I just wanted to ask, uh, do you do live videos? Often I haven't had a chance to check out your page yet, but well, after the video. So I don't think that question is for you, Bob. That question is more so for Alabama Care. But um, okay. Angelina Ballerino, uh, yes, uh, Alabama Care uh, does go uh, live with videos very often. Uh, if you, you know, I do one uh, every second Monday of the month. Uh, I'll be doing it throughout November of this year. And then there are also various uh, guests um, um, from around uh, the state that are speaking on various topics as well uh, throughout the week there. So I uh, appreciate you ask, asking that, answering that question. So if you will, uh, bring Bob book back up one more time here uh, before we go off. I really appreciate it. There, I want everybody to know uh, how you can get a copy of Bob book. It's no arm, no legs, no problem. Uh, when life happens, you can wish to die or choose to live. You can get a copy of Bob book on amazon.com. Um, great read, uh, great investment for your life. Also, we'll be sending out free autograph copies to all of those who come in and inside of the chat. So Bob, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and sharing with us. Man, it's, it's been a blessing. That's my honor, Lorenzo. You know, I'm here for anything, anytime, anything you need. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out. And, and thank you for continuing to be a valuable resource to our Birmingham community and continued success. Thank you. And also, I want to thank Alexander Bynum with Alabama Care for giving us the opportunity to share on this platform. We'll see you guys next time.